Our next guest has advised the January 6th committee with his expertise on authoritarianism. He's the author of How Fascism Works, Jason Stanley, and he joins Hari Srinivasan to analyze the hearings and the state of American democracy. Christian, thanks. Jason Stanley, thanks so much for joining us. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about the hearings yesterday. What struck you about them? Well, what struck me about them is they confirmed uh, what many have suspected, including myself, that Trump was not, if the testimony is, is accurate, that Trump was not a passive actor in the events of January 6th, but was deeply emotionally involved uh, and wanted to be there on the scene and was perhaps uh, conflicted, but, uh, but certainly was not, uh, was, not, uh, was not removing himself from the actual active uh, move towards the Capitol. You know, for our audience, we should point out that at some levels you have advised the committee, and I don't know what you can share publicly about that, but is this going according to any conversations that you might have been party to? Well, I, I, I think for me, in my case, they asked me about coups and authoritarianism and fascism and the structure of the rolling coup that we're seeing. Uh, they, which is not an aspect that they've particularly covered. Uh, I, think, I think we have covered it in the sense that we've seen that everyone in Washington knew that the election was fair. Uh, everyone in Washington, all the people who surrounded the president knew that it was, he was lying uh, and went, and many of them went along anyway. Uh, and so that to me is the aspect that needs the most attention uh, for for Americans, that so many of our leading politicians knew exactly that this was a lie and went ahead uh, with this attempt to overthrow uh, U.S. democracy. What about the levels of accountability, or I guess in this case, lack thereof? I mean, for the committee to come and you know present people one after the other that did the right thing, partly because there was a concern that the rule of law would catch up to them. But we really haven't seen it catch up to anybody yet. Absolutely. And that's why the coup is, as it were, ongoing. Because at the, it's abundantly clear that everyone surrounding uh, the president felt that uh, they were in legal jeopardy. Uh, they were in severe legal jeopardy. Uh, and that is what held them back from going ahead. Uh, we know that state by state, from state legislatures such as Michigan to, uh, to national, uh, to, to Trump's inner circle, uh, they saw clearly and obviously that this was an illegal attempt to overthrow the United States of America and, uh, and were, uh, were blocked from going forward. Uh, you know, I wish uh, as a philosopher that Socrates was right that justice could be its own reward, uh, but uh, but Socrates, Socrates' uh, interlocutors claim people are only just because they can they're punished uh, for it uh, if if they're not. And what we've seen is that the fear of punishment uh, is what uh, kept American democracy alive. And now that everyone has seen uh, that there is no accountability, that there are no consequences, uh, that means that the next time. Uh, uh, what's what's to stop the coup from succeeding? Hmm. Yeah, I also wonder about the violence, not just the day of, but the idea that there were so many people that knew that this had a very high probability of getting out of hand, and yet continued. We're talking multiple emails and texts going back and forth where people were in consultation and they were actually scared of what could happen on January 6th. I'm very glad you asked about that, Hari. That's one thing that I'm regularly asked about uh, in this context, uh, in, my in my expertise as a philosopher of language, and in particular, in my role uh, as uh, an expert and scholar on, uh, on uh, rhetoric that encourages and justifies violence. Uh, what we've seen uh, as I've talked about the, on this show before, uh, is explicit calls uh, for violence and revenge, uh, a, a narrative 
that lays out a justification for political violence. Uh, you know, ex any expert on political violence would tell you uh, that these this this kind of talk is exactly the kind of talk uh, that justifies. Uh, that justifies political violence. You're saying, take back our country. You've been betrayed. Uh, this is a revolution. Uh, all of this kind of vocabulary, the setting up of, uh, is setting up uh, mass political violence. Uh, then you have uh, this new revelation from yesterday that I really focused on about weapons that the president said, okay, they should be allowed in with their weapons, according to the witness. Um, Think about that in the context of the recent Supreme Court decision, allowing arms to be carried, uh, you know, allowing arms to be carried everywhere, essentially. So uh, this idea that we're going to have a mass prevalence of weapons uh, in the run up to uh, to uh, to an election that by all indicators looks like uh, it will involve political violence uh, and then the president saying they should be allowed to bring weapons. So I'm very concerned about this kind of normalization of political violence, this kind of, you know, this is the American way to carry guns, to have a militia. The Supreme Court is saying, no, no, no. The, the correct reading of the Second Amendment is, you know, you know, uh, when, you know, ha be armed to defend yourself against uh, what? Against what? Well, you know, the president really, that testimony yesterday seemed to suggest that the president was building a narrative that uh, that a uh, that revenge for a stole, supposedly stolen election uh, could involve uh, you know things in the Constitution that allow us to bear arms and that kind of gelling of the narrative between the Supreme Court's decision and yesterday's testimony concerns me deeply. You know that you mentioned the Supreme Court. I want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, the, the cases in the last couple of weeks have indicated a, a court that's kind of finding that it has the power and is willing to use it. It has also shaken, for a lot of people, the legitimacy of the court. I mean, public opinion numbers are down in the 20s. And I wonder what that does to a functioning democracy if we lose one branch of government, or at least perceive it as similar to the others partisan? Well, a one-party state needs to seize the courts. Uh, and this court is clearly a Republican court. Um, I mean, this, this kind of started with Bush v. Gore uh, in, uh, in uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, but this court is very clearly a partisan court. I don't think, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of owning the libs is not actually in the Constitution. Um, and so, uh, so these rulings uh, on Roe versus Wade, on hints about uh, undermining other rights uh, uh, there uh, and fulfilling a sort of kind of nakedly partisan agenda, the ruling, uh, I believe, yesterday uh, about uh, the uh, gerrymandering in Louisiana, uh, that a very severe Republican racial gerrymand was constitutional. Um, these certainly seem to check off uh, they check off Republican dream points on the platform. And you have to ask yourself, is it really the case that the founders wrote the Constitution uh, expecting to legitimate every kind of Republican wish list uh, in recent years? Uh, I think that's probably constitutionally dubious. <laughs> I think it's probably doubtful that the founders had access to the Republican Party platforms in the 21st century. So, uh, so it's it's extremely worrisome. Uh, we had a minority a president voted in by a minority of the population, appoint three radical right Supreme Court justices to join already some radical right Supreme Court justices, and they're fulfilling sort of point by point a Republican Party platform uh, to the point where Congress, Congresswoman Bobart said, uh, said uh, you know, the founders intended the church to guide the government. Um, this, the, the Constitution is becoming a kind of part of this, this mythic past, this invented mythic past that justifies everything the Republicans, uh, you know, that, that the Republicans are just inventing, uh, justifies their political priorities. Uh, and that's something that obviously is characteristic of a one-party state. 
Uh, and what, that's where we're tilting, at the very least, into a, uh, a one-party state where the, that party is supported only by a minority of the population. If you look at the poll numbers, the majority of Americans are not for overturning Roe versus Wade. I want us to talk about the role of fear, because one of the things that came up in the testimony uh, it, it recently in these hearings is that the committee asks witnesses, has anybody basically tried to intimidate you? And they get a series of responses that almost read like a script from some sort of a mob movie. Hey, you're going to be a team player? I'm going to remember you, you know, the day before their testimony. Um, how is it that either the president or his supporters still have this much power and sway being out of office? This is a long theme in the literature on authoritarianism and fascism. People always make a comparison between the fascist leader and a mob boss. Uh, in a rule of law state, everyone is equal, everyone is subject to, to law equally. Uh, in, a, in a fascist state, or maybe even an authoritarian state of whatever kind of stripe, uh, it's all about loyalty to the leader. Uh, or loy and loyalty to the party. L it's loyalty rather than rule of law. So that's how you have to think about it. So there's a lot of literature, say in the Frankfurt School, about uh, theorizing about the relationship between the mafia boss, the mob boss, and the leader of a one-party authoritarian state, Stalin, a Stalin or a Hitler, because it's loyalty to the leader that replaces the rule of law. And this is just classic what we're seeing. We're seeing loyalty to the leader. And the way, the way it works is like, you know, if the, 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 we're headed towards a one-party state in this country, let's be clear about what's happening. Uh, if it's not led by Trump, it will be led by someone else because uh, what we've seen shows, uh, shows a bunch of people what is possible. Um, so, and there's no accountability. So that is where we're headed unless Americans wake up and we all do something about it together. Um, and the way that works is, you know, the people who show loyalty will be protected, the institutions that show loyalty will be protected, and everyone else will be smashed. This is, this is really central in the literature on authoritarianism. So what should happen to the people that supported the president? Obviously, there are trials happening for the people who actually walked into the Capitol right now, and they are facing consequences. But relatively speaking, they're small fries in this all. The people who had the ability to stop this before it started or even after it started, the ones who were advising the president in ways that were anti-democratic, what should happen to them? And if nothing happens to them, then what? I'm really against the idea that only the small fry get punished. Uh, I mean, I think they are to some extent victims as well here of their leaders. The fact is, that when the leaders of a country say that people should go on the streets and overthrow that country because they've been betrayed, <laughs> then many people will believe them. And so, so I think that the United States has been betrayed by political leaders. Um, some accountability must occur. If it doesn't occur, then uh, you will see what we see right now, which is uh, in state after state elections the election apparatus being taken over by people who know that it was a complete lie that the election was stolen and think, well, America should be run just by our team uh, and American democracy, that's what the enemy is. So there must be accountability. There is a large portion of today's Republican Party that has proven itself to be against democracy. Uh, what the January 6th Commission did that was so important for our democracy is they showed that uh, Josh, uh, Senator Hawley, Senator Cruz, and the other senators who went along with this knew it was a lie. So they were part of a conspiracy to overthrow American democracy, and they should not be uh, allowed to be political leaders. Uh, I think that, uh, to me, is the kind of accountability I'd like to see. Um, you know, uh, I don't think prisons uh, need to be in the picture, uh, but some accountability must happen. We cannot have a political party that is opposed to democracy. That brings me to maybe my last question here. What is uniquely American that got us into this situation or 
prevented it from being worse. Are we capable of preventing something like this from happening? Or is our structure built where this is bound to happen again? Democracy is always fragile. Democracy is hard. This idea that we will perpetually be a democracy is, is a fiction. We're actually a new democracy. We only became a democracy once Black Americans were given the right to vote in the 1960s. So we, we were, and right now we're still a partial democracy. Democracies are fragile things by their very nature. A small sliver of humans throughout history have lived in democracies, uh, though democracy dates is an ancient system of government. Uh, the reason we're powerful uh, as a country and the reason we're special as, and the reason I'm so proud to be an American is because democracy, the vocabulary of democracy, is interwoven with being an American. So unlike other countries that can that can sort of like, you know, use democracy sort of like as a as a fig leaf, the, the vocabulary, Americans, democracy is something that is a rallying cry. Uh, so uh, it's something that the civil rights movement used. It's something that liberation movements in America have always been able to use. Uh, from Fre Frederick Douglass on, they've been able to say, we are these ideals and we're not living up to them. And that gives us a unique kind of power. Uh, and that has always in the past uh, helped us uh, in fits and starts, we always go, but we often go back, uh, but slowly move ahead, uh, forward and then backward, two steps forward, one step back. Uh, we're seeing that again, uh, those of us who study democracy, those of us who study it um, philosophically, historically, understand that democracies are fragile because one group will always want to rise up and seize power <laughs> and, uh, and, and take it for themselves. Uh, and that's the natural state of things. Uh, so it's always hard. These uh, the, and we we should recognize it's always hard. And preserving a democracy is and will always be a difficult thing to do. Jason Stanley, thanks as always. Thank you.